Qualitative Research, Introduction and Overview. Specifically in this segment of the presentation, I want to talk about the designs that are utilized in qualitative research as well as some of the sampling procedures. And as we said, these the designs and even the sampling that can be utilized in qualitative research is really diverse and it's often really difficult to kind of pigeonhole an article as fitting this design or that design. However, there are some common approaches and I think it's helpful to sort of look at them in these different groups, even though there often is overlap between these groups. So, as I said, you know, diversity really abounds in the types of designs that are utilized in qualitative research. Often they are combined. Uh, you know, we may see two different qualitative designs utilized in a study. And often qualitative designs are utilized in conjunction with a quantitative design. The article that we're considering as an example this for this unit is, is sort of this case, right? They did a quantitative study first, and then they selected the people for the qualitative part based upon their performance and some of their uh, information from the first part of the study. So really diversity abounds. We'll see all kinds of studies and different types of methodologies. However, they do sort of uh, follow these broad categories that I want to talk about. So I'm going to introduce them here and I don't feel like you have to memorize them all at this point. We're going to actually cover them in greater detail in the next two units. So uh, don't feel that we uh, you need to have a great depth of understanding of each one, but I think it is helpful to kind of look at them all, uh, you know, briefly at the beginning, and then we'll go into more depth later on into the different types of uh, studies that are performed. And what again, qualitative research allows us to do is collect variety from a variety, collect information from a variety of different sources, whether it be people themselves through interviews or surveys, or uh, text documents that were written, or even letters of correspondence going back and forth or emails between two people in a way to kind of tease out what they were thinking at the time and, and what maybe motivated, motivated them to make different decisions. So there are a lot of different types of observations that researchers can use here, whether it be, again, these written documents, interviews, or even just sitting, observing, and measuring different types of activities how often they occur, uh, and so on. Uh, lots of different ways to gather data in this uh, type of methodology. The book uh, that we that I've referenced uh, does a really nice job of kind of explaining the different designs and breaking them into these kind of broad categories, and they include you know eth ethnographic studies or ethnographies, uh, case studies phenomenological studies, narrative studies, and then two different types of text analysis, one that's looking more at qualitative data and one that's looking more critically from a specific type of a perspective. But let's talk about each of these in a little more detail. Uh, the first, an ethnography, uh, attempts to describe a culture or a group. Uh, again, a specific culture or group or subgroups within a group. And uh, we will typically see the type of data that they utilize as observations, you know, looking how individuals from that, that group uh, interact with others and so on, how they approach a particular situation, interviews, uh, and texts. Case studies typically look at one or two people or a very specific type of uh, 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 experience and then attempt to describe that event or program or case or activity uh, with observations, interviews, texts, and so on. In our field, we see a lot of case studies. You know, an extreme athlete that can perform at an incredibly high level will often see case studies on them. You know, how do they prepare? What was their mindset? What was their nutritional uh, strategy and so on. And again, while a case study, you know, a an N of one or a sample size of one doesn't mean we can apply that to everybody. It still means, though, that we can potentially glean some useful information from what they were thinking, what their experiences were, and so on. So that's typically what we see in a case study. In a phenomenological study, what we see here is we attempt, uh, th there tends to be some 
uh, phenomenon that occur, some particular uh, activity in a, a particular experience or a particular behavior that we saw in a group of people. And then we try to describe or interpret uh, how they, why they acted, why they took the actions that they did from their point of view. So these are typically interviews. I believe that the study that we ha are using as an example in this series of presentations would fall into this category because what we saw was we had a group or a subset of the original study uh, that decreased their non-exercise physical activity. So that's the phenomenon. We had these group of people that decreased their other activity in response to being placed on an exercise program. And what we wanted to do, what the researchers wanted to do was figure out why that is. Why did they stop doing these other things? Was it a conscious choice? Was it a subconscious choice? If so, you know, what were the different factors that impacted their decision to do so? And by knowing those factors, maybe we can prevent people from decreasing their non-exercise physical activity. So again, that was a, an example that we saw with our uh, kind of uh, study that we're looking at right now. A narrative study attempts to bring order and coherence to a life story or a uh, life stories. You know, uh, often you see this in individuals that were uh, faced with an extreme event and we've heard their story and we wanna get, get more information about what we were thinking uh, or what they were thinking during the event and uh, why they behaved the way they did. I, I have to say, I just uh, was reading an excerpt from a, a book about 9-11 and they were interviewing a number of different individuals uh, about uh, what their role was on that day, you know, how the country reacted. And um, it, it was fascinating because what it did is it put us in the, it, it puts the reader in the shoes of the person and that situation they were in and uh, what was going through their mind at that particular time. So really interesting and gives you a depth of understanding that you wouldn't otherwise have without hearing their side of the story, so to speak. So very interesting. And then uh, a text analysis, and uh, which is a qualitative document analysis, basically takes uh, official documents and personal documents, describes them, and attempts to put, again, in perspective why different aspects of that document exist and so on. And I utilizes print and electronic documents produced by the actors. So again, if uh, an example of this might be when the Declaration of Independence was written, um, you know, maybe we're interested in why certain aspects were included or not included. And what researchers will do is not only look at the declaration itself, but look at other documents produced by the people that were in the act of writing the declaration to get an idea of why they were, what they were thinking, maybe why they included certain aspects and uh, or did not include certain aspects. And then text analysis, critical analysis, does a similar thing, but it describes or interprets from a an outside perspective. So by knowing kind of the end result of a situation, we can examine uh, the person's uh, decisions and their uh, interpretations uh, 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 with a different kind of a frame or different type of a perspective. And as I said, a lot of qualitative research falls uh, not just in one of these categories, but maybe multiple categories, because they are often very broad in trying to include as much information as possible. The design, to a great extent, kind of determines what information you're going to use. You know, will you be utilizing interviews? Will you be looking at documents and so on? Another very important aspect of planning this type of research, qualitative research, is deciding who you're going to interview, who you're going to interact with, what documents you're going to utilize. Uh, and that's called sampling. We're gonna talk about sampling in qualitative studies. We're gonna talk about sampling in quantitative studies. And kind of as you kind of uh, picked up from the uh, first unit in this course, the sample, the people that are used are very important because uh, in, in studies, we want to see, like if we're trying to apply this to our own clients, our own athletes or people that we work with, we want the actors, the sample, the people in these studies to be similar to the people I work with. So if I work with elderly and a big part of what I do is uh, trying to improve their health and wellness, the study that we've been talking about for this series of presentations 
is really useful for, for me because I work with elderly. I'm trying to get them to be physically active to improve their health. And now I know from these interviews, from that study, that they're often, even though I get them in the gym and get them exercising, I may see a decrease in other activity that I can't see. So I need to get them thinking about that and try to prevent that decrease in non-exercise physical activity. So by looking at the sample and the people that they interacted with, regardless of the type of study, it tells me how applicable that is to my population. So sampling and qualitative studies is important. And you want to choose people for your qualitative studies, which they call them actors, that they need to be central to the situation you're attempting to describe. So example, again, back to the research that we've looked at, if they chose and interviewed all of the people that, that were involved in the study and asked them why they decreased their non exercise physical activity, it wouldn't be as useful because we'd be asking people that didn't decrease their non-exercise activity to describe these types of things. So by choosing the people that failed to act or decrease their activity, we get better data, better information. So uh, again, it's important that we choose the right people, the people that are central to the uh, question that you have. Uh, the act, you know, and so on. The actors is the term that's often used in qualitative studies as opposed to subjects or participants. They're often called actors. They, you need to select actors from various aspects of the event. So example, like if you, uh, I've seen uh, narratives that uh, talk about, uh, for instance, the uh, US hockey team that won the Olympics. And uh, from the perspective of attempting to get at what was it about that team that made it so special? What made that team able, uh, be able to overcome such odds and win the Olympics? So they interviewed people. Who would you want to interview uh, as part of that? You'd probably want to interview some of the players. You'd probably want to interview some of the players that were the stars, but also some of the players that were kind of behind the scenes, didn't play as much. You may want to include some of the coaching staff. You may want to include athletic trainers, strength conditioning coaches, other people, depending upon the kind of information that you get, because all of those things may be played a part in helping them achieve that success. So you need to think about the actors. The researcher needs to think about the actors that are involved so they get the information and the wealth of information that they may need to really help them make accurate conclusions. Obviously, we need to consider, are we going to just interview individuals? Are we going to also look at their, uh, uh, again, maybe communications with others at the time? Because if you ask a person to reflect upon a, an event, over time, their reflection, their knowledge and memory of the event changes. But by going back to things that they did or wrote during the actual event, we may get more accurate information or it may trigger some ideas that maybe they didn't remember. So you have to choose information rich sources, sources that are going to give us a wide range of information that can be included in these types of studies. And that's what quality, uh, qualitative studies do. There really are two kinds of sampling uh, that's, that are utilized in qualitative studies. One is purposeful sampling, and that's used by far the most frequently. It's where there's a deliberate process in selecting the setting and the actors in which you are going to interact with. You know, it's not always possible to interview everybody associated with an event or a particular phenomenon. So you have to potentially choose them. And you can choose them by using typical samples, which is just regular people that were involved. We can try to use extreme or deviant samples. Maybe some people responded really well to a treatment and others not as much. Maybe you want to interview the people at the extreme ends, the, uh, the people that were, uh, again, benefited very strongly or benefited not at all. So we want to extreme, make sure that we interview those extreme individuals. We may want a maximum variation where we get people through all ranges of the population. We may want homogeneous samples, meaning uh, again, if we have uh, uh, 
80% men and 20% women, we, in the whole population, we may want to have 80% men and 20% women in our sample population to make it homogeneous, make it similar, our sample similar to the population as a whole. And again, the factors we may include could be gender, could be age, could be ethnic background, it could be socioeconomic background. Again, to make sure that we're getting the thoughts and ideas from a, a whole range of the different participants. There also are examples of critical samples. You know, there maybe were one or two people that were really key. We want to make sure we get them. And then snowball samples, which is where the researcher starts with a small sample group and they ask the actual people, who else should I interview about this? Who else would have information about it? And that, uh, again, uh, is called the snowball sample technique. Theoretical sampling is where the actors or the text that the researcher chooses uh, are are basically to either confirm or uh, uh, negative case samples where they will deny or be kind of contrary to what the, the beliefs are. Uh, so again, you, you select people or you select information to either confirm a conclusion or to try to uh, put, put doubt upon a conclusion. So really two different types of sampling types. We see purposeful sampling by far the most frequently. And again, with the goal of attempting to get enough people sampled or in the sample that can give a range of potential responses.